when I'm ready. Now, I, I, I don't know what the focus of this panel is going to be because uh, because we can talk about anything you want. So, I guess I guess the uh, the best way to start this uh, for all of you is to. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Gary Chalk. I play the voice of Optimus Prime, or I have played the voice of Optimus Prime. One of four, three of which were Canadian, which is odd, I know, but it's true. Uh, David Kay, myself, and Peter Cullen are all from Canada, and, and the only one who was not uh, Canadian was uh, Neil Kaplan, who did one of the uh, prelate ones, and that was. Uh, He's from San Francisco, I think. He lives in San Francisco. Anyway, um, I've been uh, a, a voiceover performer for about 30 years. I, uh, I think the very first uh, cartoon I ever did was Hiawatha for uh, Nickelodeon. It was a Kenner Classics. And I actually saw it on eBay somewhere for sale. Or it's, a, it's, it's on there somewhere. But uh, that was the very first cartoon I did, and I, and I went, well, I, I kind of like this, uh, this career. It's kind of fun. You know, and I had no idea what it was about. And uh, to give you an idea of what it was like back then, which was about 1981, <coughs> um, we used to uh, record on tape. I know it's odd. <laughs> but we used to record on tape, and... Uh, it was a long and involved process. And I played Hiawatha and Bujikiwis and about three or four characters on this cartoon. And it was quite exciting. And uh, I remember when we were doing a, a, the, the uh, what they call it ADR. And you, you know, are familiar with what ADR is a automatic dialogue replacement or additional dialogue replacement. And these days they have computers and you just go, it goes, Beep, 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 talk, right? And you dub the the the, the language of uh, you know there'll be in Japanese or something, and you dub it into English, and it's very easy. In those days, they used to do it on film, and they'd show it, run a projector, and it would show up on the screen like this, and they'd have a black line on this side and a black line on this side, and you'd watch the film, and the black lines would go like this, and as soon as they touched you'd start talking. Well, it was a real trip to do it. Now it's like easy. It's like, you know, when I was a kid, we had to walk uphill both ways to school. And it was like that. It was very, very difficult. Uh, since then, I've probably done a few thousand cartoons, uh, many, many series. Uh, some of them I think you'd be familiar with. Uh, I was He-Man for a while. It was uh, Lieutenant Stone and Pathfinder and all those on G.I. Joe and G.I. Joe Extreme and uh, Knights of Justice, um, uh, Littlest Pet Shop, Extreme Dinosaurs, Sonic the Hedgehog, the list goes on. There's like tons of them. I, I can't remember them all, but I, I know that there there's a lot of them out there and I, I had the uh, great opportunity to do one of the very first uh, CGI cartoons, which was Reboot. And Reboot was the very first computer generated image cartoon for television. And you know, you go, Pixar goes on about, you know, Toy Story, oh, we've made all these innovations, ah! We're ripping, we're ripping them out in three weeks, we're ripping out an episode in three weeks, it's all CGI, and they're thinking, we're making, breaking new ground, no, no, no. Our guys have been doing it, we did it first and we get it faster. And, uh, it's funny, you know, because when you look at, at uh, Reboot right now, uh, the way it was, it was the very first cartoon, and there was a lot of technical issues that, that they had to deal with, and one of them was making the feet touch the ground. It was very difficult, and then they got into shadowing and the 3D animation, and it was, it was really quite iconic, and I was quite blessed to be able to, to be a part of that several characters in that series. My uh, favorite one being, I don't know if you remember good, remember Reboot? Put the button, I don't want to 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 put the button, I
like I'm like, we'll kill us. <laughs> but uh, we 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 did that show for several years, and then uh, uh, Beast Wars came, up. and um, I really wasn't you know all that familiar with with uh, the Transformers. I used to do all the commercials for for Transformers Generation Two. I don't know if you ever remember, but I remember that. I'm looking, I'm watching, you know, on YouTube or, or somewhere, they had some of the old commercials from the, the G1, G2 days. And I'm looking, wait a minute, I did those commercials. It's a Transformers, Generation 2, battery sold separately. Some of them were All those rollos. And, uh, and so that was my first exposure to the Transformers. And then uh, they came and asked me to come and read for the, for the series. And I said, okay. And uh, I read for all these different parts. I read for Rat Trap and read for, for actually it was, it was between me and David for Megatron. I was going to do Megatron, but then they said, well, you know, we kind of like this, um, this Optimus guy. And I said, Optimus, okay, cool. I don't know who it is, but cool. You know, I mean, you got to figure I was, um, at the, when I was a kid, Quick Draw McGraw was a big thing, you know, and Huckleberry Hound and all those uh, kind of cartoons. So I really wasn't up on it, and I never realized how big a deal it was. So I just did it, and then uh, went to a convention, and and it was just like Galaxy Quest, you know, when he comes in. You <laughs> come walking into the room, and there's all these people, and I swear to God, the the guy who was handling it, it was for the, the two guys who were here earlier. They uh, brought me in and introduced to uh, to some of the fans, and and there were about three or four girls sitting at a table over here. And they all went, what, what's the matter? It was kind of weird. But then when I saw Galaxy Quest, I went, hey, wait a minute. They're the same girls. <laughs> so it's a bit crazy. So uh, and since that time, as I say, we've done a lot of uh, iconic shows and a lot of uh, different cartoon characters. But I've also been... I've been doing movies for over 30 years, and uh, I was in Stargate for several years, and uh, in uh, Cold Squad, and uh, Poltergeist, and you know, lots of shows. Very excited about a new show coming up called uh, Alcatraz, which is J.J. Um, Abrams' new show, the guy who wrote Lost. And this is a very, very cool show, because it takes place in Alcatraz in 1963, and what happens is, 300 prisoners from Alcatraz in 1963, all of a sudden just disappear. And then in the present day, they start showing up, they haven't aged, and they're still committing the same crimes. they've all escaped. So there's some weird plot, we don't know what it is yet, but uh, it's very cool, Sam Neill's in it, and uh, uh, Johnny Coyne is in it, and a bunch of uh, different uh, actors and actresses, quite, and uh, Jorge, uh, the guy who was the the, the fat guy in, in Lost, Jorge Rodriguez or something, I think that's his name. But he's in it. He plays the doctor. It's it's very cool. So um, so it's been quite a quite a career in the last uh, in the last thirty or so years, and uh, and uh, it's that that's brought me here today to say hi to all of you people, and. Um, I guess the, the best way to start this panel to, to do something is, what is it that you want? What do you want to get out of this panel? What is, uh, what is it that you're most interested in? What would you like to know? I think I can uh, answer almost any question except, <coughs> what was the question? Oh yeah, someone asked me, in episode seven, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first season of Beast Wars, you had a dialogue, it was a very touching scene between you and Rat Trap, or no, you and, and, uh, and uh, Cheetor, and, and he had said something, and you had said, but that's okay, Cheetor, and I, I just want to know what was going through your head. <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> I, I had no 
idea. I mean, good God, what, what, what the hell are you going to do? I mean, you come up with a question and it just comes out from nowhere. And, uh, you know, I have a hard time remembering what happened last week, much less what happened a decade ago. So. Anyway, um, how, how about we kick it off and uh, ask me a question? Oh, that's good. Yes, here we go. I've got one. Um, what was your initial reaction to not only finding out that in Robots in the Skies you would not be Optimus, but then in Armada you were brought back? Th those two instances. Oh, well, How did what, that happened with, what happened with that is they did Robots in the Skies down in the States. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the state, but I, uh, I seem to recall that it was a prelay show, or not a prelay show, it was an ADR show. And um, we weren't uh, informed of, of what happened. They were trying to do something different with robots in disguise down in uh, down south. And um, you know, kudos to to, to Neil to for doing that because um, I didn't know who he was. And, uh, I had met him at an anime convention uh, a few years ago in Calgary, and we, uh, we chatted about it. So it only went that one time, and I don't know why. And then when they brought me back for Armada, I, uh, I, I did say initially, uh, no, no, I don't want to come back for, for Armada. You, did, you, you guys uh, didn't want us for, for robots in the sky. What are you coming back here for? And then we said, nah, what the hell. So David Kay and I decided that we were going to come back and uh, do Armada, and then we went on to do Cybertron Energy. Huh? Energy. That's the one. Did that one. And uh, and uh, it was fine. I, I personally I gotta tell you the truth. I hate doing ADR on those shows. And the and the the deal with me with with uh, the ADR shows was that I developed a character for for Primal. For Optimus Primal. And I love that character. It was a great character, and the, the writing was great, and the storytelling was great. I thought it was uh, a well-written, well-put-together series, except for season three, which was kind of, you know, they're all a bunch of whiners. And all <laughs> he didn't do anything, and Optimus spent most of his time contemplating his navel. <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> is it not? Is it not true? The keys to the future lie buried in the past. What the hell is that? Mean? <laughs> 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 the Dr. Keys and Cheetor and all the rest are all going after each other, but uh, I like that. And when we went to do the prelay, it was a different character. They wanted a different character, and then and I said, okay. So they wanted to be more like, more like the uh, the Peter Cullen version. You know, they wanted more tougher, more, you know, this. I went, okay. But the problem is, is when you hear, you know, and they speak really fast in phrases like this. And now you're trying to make it fit into that same rhythm. Cybertron, or, or Jetfire, Ironhide, this way, let's go, right away. You know, it was hard to, to make a character and create a character, and also fit it within those tight guidelines uh, of the uh, of the ADR. And so, what you got was sort of mm, fifty percent. You didn't get a hundred percent because I like my I have my own rhythms and my own uh, you know thought processes. And when you hear the beep beep beep, it's just fit the words in the space. You know? <laughs> and a lot of people didn't like it. I, uh, I found, um, the, because the original creator of, of G1, you know, Peter Cullen, when, he, when Peter Cullen did G1, it was prelim. So he got to use his rhythms and his uh, acting beats. I had to make it fit in that, and uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a good process, not nearly as good as, uh, as Prime. So that, that's my, my reaction to that. Uh, it wasn't really a bad bad deal. I mean, I'd already moved on to a, a lot of other different shows. And, and uh, we just, you know, live and learn. Uh, next question. 
Yes, sir. What was the character everybody on when you made Beast Wars? Everybody seemed to agree with you. Which one? What was the most hated character between the voice actors on Beast Wars? On Beast Wars? The most hated character? I mean, like the character nobody really liked. Even the voice acting did them possibly. Oh, you mean like personally? I mean like as in, oh, this, trend, this is just the most annoying voice for Transformers to the series. Oh, you mean like Wasp <laughs> <laughs> It's a weird voice, but that was uh, that was one voice that used to drive me out of my mind. <laughs> but it's the most popular voice ever. But uh, I couldn't listen to it for a long, long time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill you! I'm going to kill you! <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why you died so much. Then, huh? That's probably why he died every time. He died all the time, but but he still kept coming back for more. <laughs> Poor, poor guy. Um, okay, the, the, yeah. that, that I thought was probably the most annoying voice for me personally. Everybody loves Watchmen. I mean, I love them too, but uh, that's the one that drove me the, the craziest. My favorite character was uh, uh, Rampage. Is it Rampage? Or Ravage? Ravage was a. I shall be queen! Yes, my queen! Inferno. 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 What's that? Inferno. Inferno. Is that what his name was? Yes. Inferno. Yes, my, yeah. yes, my queen! <laughs> Jimmy Burns. Uh, Jim Burns played that character. And uh, Jim Burns is a uh, well, hometown is around here somewhere in St. Louis, Missouri. And, um, and he's a wonderful blues man and a, a great character. And, but of all the characters, uh, I love Cheetor, I love Rat Trap. Rat Trap was a great character. Rhinox. Um, what's Silverbolt? That was another one that I quite liked. And uh, Tarantulas and Pterosaur. And, uh, they, were, they were all great characters. Yes. What, what did you think about them bringing Fiberhawk onto the show to bring Blue Man Kuma back after missing so many episodes and practically kind of season? Oh, as, uh, as the tiger. Yeah, oh no, I thought that was, uh, it was great. Um, Blue's still going strong. Yes, I was upset they broke him off the show and they brought him back for the last three episodes as Tiger Hawk. Yeah. So he was on the show, on the show, on the show, they brought him off, and he's like, oh, when am I coming back? And then they brought him back for the last Well, three. I think that what happens in a situation like that, I've had a situation like that, well, I've got that with Voltron for us. You know, Voltron, I show up every once in a while, then I disappear, and then I go, where am I? And then I show up, and then I disappear, and I'm, well, what's going on? You know, I think I only ended up doing like seven episodes or eight episodes of that show. And it's just the writers get into a, the writers get into a pattern, or they get into a story arc. And the story arc will just follow a certain few characters. And this character, just like in real life, this character sort of fades away, but it will come back. You know, it's always there. It was nothing. Uh, it had nothing to do with uh, with the character or the performance. It's just the way the story arcs go. Sometimes you can't be in every show, and uh, in in some cases, that's that's a blessing. You know, you know, you can especially in, in live action, like when you're doing a television series. <coughs> like uh, I'm doing a series right now called The Killing. You heard of the the the, huh? the new series of The Killing? And I play the lead girl's boss, Lieutenant Oaks, on that. And I show up for, you know, two or three scenes a, an episode, and go, and go, and that's kind of nice. You know, I have some free time, because it's a huge time commitment uh, when you're doing a uh, television series or, or even cartoon series. You're there every day, 12, 14 hours a day. And that uh, can be exhausting. I mean, it's good. It's good money and everything. But still, you get tired. You pay the price. And uh, there was a time, uh, Scotty can tell you, and uh, Ian and a few of the others, who, when we were like the only voice guys around, that we worked literally uh, seven days a week, every single day, doing two shows a day, different series. 
like we had like seven, eight different series going. And do that for several months, and you turn into an idiot. You know, you're just like, what? I can't do this anymore. <laughs> it's just like, it's very tiring. I don't know if you've ever tried to do voiceover, any voiceover stuff, but go <laughs> and do that eight hours a day. And uh, it's, it's exhausting and it's hard on your voice. And we were doing it seven days a week. So uh, now it's kind of nice. You know, you work a little bit, take some time off. Yes. So you're doing that many. What did you. Were there exercises or something you did to keep your voice in check so you didn't lose it? Is there certain yeah. precautions? Um, the thing about the thing about your voice is you can burn your voice out in ten minutes if you do it wrong. And what a lot of people do is they try and concentrate their voices right up here in the throat and in their neck. And what happens is your vocal cords get strained. And if you try and like, if I had tried to talk like this all day long, I'm done. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's the same with, uh, you know, those, those guys who do that type of voice all day long, do that, and your voice is gone. But you have to bring it from here. <coughs> you have to support it. You have to exercise it. And, uh, and there are lots of warm-up exercises. Basically, it's keep it relaxed. The more tense you get, the more tightened up you get up here and in here, the more difficult it is to, uh, to maintain the good voice quality. And what happens is, uh, one of the, uh, the things that, uh, that happens is you'll get nodes, little, little bumps on your, uh, on your vocal cords, which, which is death for a voiceover person because you can't, once you get it removed, you can't talk or sing for two years. Also, sing every single day. Singing is the greatest thing in the world to uh, to uh, keep your voice uh, in shape, keep your vocal cords in shape. Um, uh, let's see what else. Staying within your range. I mean, some have a, a great range, but there are a lot of people. It's just, I, I guess because I come from both sides. I come from the voiceover side, and I also come from the singer side. Now, I, I, I do a lot of singing and playing, and uh, I always make sure that I never go too high or too low. You have to stay in, in your range, in your comfortable range. Because you'll watch a lot of inexperienced performers, they got this, they all think they're Getty Lee or something, you know, and they get up there, <laughs> and they say, well, high, high, like this. It doesn't last very long, and it sounds horrible. It sounds like you're killing a cat. <laughs> but but it, 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 it's because they just can't support it. It's what you can support. If you can support your voice in a lot of different uh, ranges, then that's fine. But if you can't, then you're just doing yourself a disservice and your career becomes very, very short. So, that's, yes? I'm sorry? Do you play guitar? Yeah, I play guitar, piano. Uh, I'm a big blues guy. And I play, well, I play everything from Dylan and Pico and do, uh, you know, do things like, uh, well, I play uh, Fight for Fighting, Jack Johnson, um, uh, Muddy Waters, uh, you know, Willie Dixon and that kind of thing, and I also do Dylan songs. And there were all different, I do all different kinds, because I was primarily a singer when, at the beginning. And uh, most voiceover people are, are pretty good singers, you know. And uh, that's another thing, is educating your voice. Because, um, as far as, uh, excuse me, I keep it back. Um, as far as voicing goes, you have to, you have to have a really good ear to hear the difference between this, 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 this. There are five different ways of saying it. But you have to be able to hear the difference between them. Because of voice acting, what happens is you have a, a, a situation or a, 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 a scene that has a certain geographical uh, uh, aspect to it. Like I'm sitting here and you're sitting there, or the person who's sitting way back there, it's a different volume 
if you're talking to a person in the back of the room and if you're talking to someone right here. And um, so you have to see that, that image in your mind. And uh, even if it's, you know, a uh, spaceship hurtling down towards the earth with rockets going and blah, blah, blah. What are we doing? I don't know. Well, oh my God, we got bad guys on the fourth side. Ah! You know, you got all that stuff going on. But you have to make it work within that. And uh, all your physical actions and all your emotional actions have to be absolutely clear. Because if they're not, uh, once they animate the, your voice, what happens is you record here, they animate, and it goes and it flattens it out until it sounds real. Right? Now, everybody can do a funny voice. Everybody can do, you know, a couple of phrases or, you know, uh, to infinity and beyond. You know, they can do that. But can you do Shakespeare in it and make it believable? That's the key. So your acting is about 75% of it. Your voicing is about 25%. I mean, if you have a great <coughs> voice and a, and a, and a, and a, uh, a, uh, a voice that has a lot of range, and you have the acting skills, <coughs> holy moly, you got a career that's going to last forever. Right? But uh, that's what it is, because it, it, it's, like, uh, it's like all the characters that you listen to or watch on the cartoon, they have their own reality. Right? It's an unreal situation, like, you know, like Ren and Stimpy, Oh, Ren! Oh, Ren! What are they doing? We're going to take over the world. You know, and Pinky and the Brain and all those. But it's real for them. And in order for, for, for us as the audience to care about what they're doing, it has to be real for us, too. So if you hear a lie, or you hear someone who is not doing a very good job, you go, Meh. Sounds kind of lame. You know, I'm not really in there. I'm not really caring about this. I'm not going to watch it anymore. Because it's the characters that draw you in. And even though they're wacky characters, they're still playing in a real place. And coming and playing in a, in a real world. It's a different world, but it's a real world. And so that's why I get a kick out of, uh, what's the show? Uh, the Rift? Tripping the Rift? Oh. <laughs> you see that? Tripping the Rift? I love that show. The characters in it are terrific. Not to mention the babe is pretty odd. <laughs> but no, but the, the the characters are great, and uh, uh, the fat guy with the tentacles uh, and the three eyes. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Is that what his name is? Yeah. Very funny guy. But you you look at that character and you're and you're looking at him. You're going, okay, he's got tentacles and he's got three eyes. But he's a pretty funny guy. And you forget that he's got tentacles and three eyes. You just see him as this character that you're endeared to, right? And that's what it's about. So it's playing the reality of the of those characters uh, to make it work. Next question. Yes? Um, in our model, we're like, I don't know if they've ever seen, but like the first season, when it, when you, and without this transforms, it sounds like they record you saying transform once, and you just get playing it whenever you transform. I'm sorry again. In in Armada, yes. Um, when Bob is transformed, it sounded like they just record you saying "transform" once, and you just get playing that when you transform. No, I just say it every time. Yeah. You mean it was a uh, something something combine da 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 combine da 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 combine? You know that is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, we had to do it every time because it was always different. And uh, the timing was different, so you couldn't really just you know take one and fit it into the. Yeah, other. I mean, like like just like when you just like transform like like a robot truck like that. Be like Transformers, transform. Yeah. That it's not one. like you, you were. Yeah. No, I'd have to do it every show <laughs> because the timing was different yeah. on everything. They uh, it would be nice if they had a stock one, and then no one else would have, like, just go in and go. Yeah, transform, transform. Are we done? Okay, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. You know, it's like Presta, you know. Don't go away, we'll be right back. See ya. Uh, Presta, we haven't turned it on yet. You know, from uh, Simpsons. Remember, Presta used to do all the bumpers. And uh, he'd just go, yeah, yeah, don't go away, we'll be back in a minute. Hey, 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 this is Presta, we'll be right back. Hey, okay, see ya. And he'd walk out the door. Uh, Wait, we haven't turned on the tape yet. <laughs> but that was, but, you know, that was.
would be, that's the lazy man's way, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we couldn't do that because the way that we recorded originally, the, in the original Japanese track, it's always different. So the timing is always different. So if I said transform for this particular show, it would be different for the next show. It'd be a, so you'd have to say it. It would sound the same, but it'd be a different timing. Yes? I was going to ask you, since we're talking about reused footage or reused dialogue, when you did the new adventures in He-Man, did they have you say by the power of attorney every time they would do that, or was that part stock footage? By the power of Eternia was every time. It was every time, okay. I have a power, yeah, every time. They had John Irwin, they just did him once, and then they just, oh, we're gonna use all those cells in the But it sounds like it too, right? Did anyone else have a problem when they watched that part? Did they, did they, if they close their eyes, did they see Optimal Optimus holding the sword up in their eyes? You know, you close your <laughs> eyes, and you're like, yep, that's Optimal Optimus with the, with the gray skull. <laughs> no. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because the new adventures of E-Man was recorded about five years before uh, Optimal Optimus. But I mean, what, what but there were there would be people going, wait a minute, Optimus sounds like E-Man. <laughs> I, I saw I saw I saw trans I saw Beast Wars before I saw the E-Man. Oh, did you? I was over at Sin's house. I'm like, I'm, I'm in the kitchen, and I'm like. Did Optimal Optimus just take power of eternity? I'm like, what? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's it's funny when you if you see it, you know, yeah. opposite. But I did, I recorded uh, e man long before I did uh, Optimus. It would be funny enough. And then the new the new new adventures of e man I was too old to play e man. <laughs> 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 they they made me man at arms, yep. which was so now you'll hear now when you watch the new new adventures of e man. It was a gentleman man at arms sounds like E Man. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> but it's uh, you know we tr we try our best to you know keep, keep everything different. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite fun. Yes, I don't know. Everybody's taking it in. Nobody's got any questions well, over here. Well, but yes, you have a question. Do you feel like the um, the job of the voiceover is disappearing from so many things like the Disney movies and? Oh, you mean like stunt casting, especially for Disney and Pixar and things like that. <laughs> stunt casting, I've never understood, and uh, the the voiceover community in, in Los Angeles and uh, in Vancouver, we all feel the same way. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares if they're they they're in the part? I mean, the one that drove me crazy was. Um, Bruce Willis doing over the hedge. He played the raccoon in over the hedge. It was okay. But, you know, there are a ton of voiceovers who, guys who could have done a, 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 an incredible job on that character and made that character work. I mean, he, he's supposed to be the driver of the show, and it was the little squirrel that's, you know, with the, with the, the cheese whiz up the nose who, who uh, who drove that show? I mean, they were great. And the turtle was, you know, they were all great. And I remember um, uh, Bruce Willis in an interview said, "I can't believe it. They made me do this line 51 times. It drove me crazy 51 times. It's so hard this voice work." I said, "No, it's not. You suck." <laughs> If, if, it, if it took us 51 takes to do a line, we'd be fired. Right. The most that we would ever get, except for, you know, there was a couple of shows that we did uh, where we would do like 10 takes for a line, and that was pushing. Uh, it, would, uh, it would be like the most, the most, like three or four takes for a line. Just, to, you know, to get the, the thing right. It would, uh, because it would drive you crazy. If you had to do 51 takes per month, or 40 days per month, you'd never get the show done. You know, we record a show in like three hours, uh, or, or, you know, a feature will take all day to record. But 41 takes a line, you, you figure a line takes 
30 seconds or 20 seconds to do a line. Multiply it by 41 and you've got you know, 20 minutes for one line. You have 200 lines to do in the show. 200 times that's 400 minutes. 400 recorded minutes. Holy moly, that's a lot of editing. Yeah. And a lot of recording. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I have never been a big proponent of, uh, of uh, stunt casting because the kids who are watching the show could care less. They don't even know who these voices are. All they see is the characters. It's for the parents who take the kids. It's just a marketing thing for parents who take the kids. It has nothing to do with kids. And uh, there are a lot of big name voice actors. The, you know, the Frank Welker who, who shows up on, on parts. Uh, uh, Billy West, uh, Maurice LaMarche. All these guys who, uh, who do voices day in, day out in LA and work for scale. <coughs> They never get a look in. They always hire the A-list actors, the, the richest actors in Hollywood, always get hired, and they get paid these stupid salaries, like five, ten million dollars, or twenty million dollars, like for Shrek. Twenty million dollars for Cameron Diaz to do this part. There are a hundred voice actors in LA who could do the show. Not only could they do it quicker, but they could do it better. And uh, they would only get the, the regular scale rate, which is uh, in America is about five hundred dollars. And so you do it, you know, someone would get five hundred or a thousand dollars to do that show, and yet they'll pay this person twenty million dollars for cachet, you know, for for marketability to get the parents to take the kids so that the parents can enjoy it as well. And it's always been a sticking point. In, in, uh, Voiceover world, uh, stunt casting. We we're not really we're not really cool with it. We hate it <laughs> because we can't get it. I worked my whole life in voiceover, thousands of cartoons, and this person who's already richer than God is going to make twenty million dollars in one shot. It's so easy. I don't even have to get changed. Because <laughs> they've never done it before, right? Yeah. Is there any kind of like a, a like a rep or some kind of I guess a maybe not a union, I guess it would be the word, but some kind of like organization? Yeah. Like no, we just well we just have our union. We don't really have an organization of right. voice actors. I mean there's the you know voice over heroes, it's it's on the um, on the net and behind the scenes, but no, we're just you know there, it's a it's a very small group, believe it or not. There are not a lot of uh, voiceover performers like in in Vancouver. There's there's about 200, but the ones who do most of the work is probably about maybe 30. In Los Angeles, there's about 3,000, and there's about uh, less than 200, probably about 50 or 60 who do most of the animation that you see. I mean, if you, if you actually take a look and just go through the credits, you'll see, you know, the, uh, you know, the Yardley Smiths, the Frank Welkers, the Peter Cullens, the, uh, uh, who else is in there, um, Sue Blue, you know, all these different guys, and there are guys and gals, and there's probably about 50 of them that you will see that will show up in absolutely every cartoon that's ever produced. Because it's a, it's a skill that um, it's hard to acquire. Because it's a, it's a very specific uh, thing. It's, it's to be able to, to sit and, and open the script and sit down there and bring it to life right now, right away. There's no, uh, there's no rehearsal time. There's no, you know, go home and study it. And, and get all the the uh, the acting beats and the and the timing. It's right now, and it's uh, it takes a long time to get it. Uh, but it, and some people have a very difficult time reading. You got to be a really good reader. Anyway, next, yes. Is there uh, any piece of work you've done that you wish you could have redone when you hear it later? And if so, was there one that kind of sticks out to you? If there was a if you heard something that you've done a while ago and you, 
you wish you could redo it. Is there an event any time like that? And what would stick out to you as an example of that? Iowa. Iowa. Because it was my very first one. And when I listen to it, I go. <laughs> I a little bit. But uh, the other ones, I uh, I don't think there's anything I would do different. I, I would probably, uh, in the Armada and uh, Energon, I would have probably uh, got more into the into the culling range. I was very stubborn about it. I, just, I don't want to do it like Peter Cullen, because that's Peter Cullen's thing. I want to do it like Primal. And he said, well, we don't want primal. And I said, okay. <laughs> so, I, would, I, I wish that would have been a little less stubborn uh, than, than the, way that, uh, the way that they actually wanted. I couldn't do that. I mean, it was just a silly pride thing that got in my ego. Uh, you know, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes? While doing your, while you were doing the voice, this was a hard to stay in character. I'm sorry? Like, was it hard to stay in character while you were doing voices? Was it hard to stay in character? Uh, no, no, not really. Uh, you, um, you, you get your foundation for your character, and, uh, and once you get the, the character set, it, 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 it's just like, you know, like you and I sitting here talking today. You, know, just, you get into it, and you're there. Um, I just think of characters that I used to do, I don't remember in Sonic the Hedgehog, he used to do this character Grounder. And Grounder was, hey, let's go, what, that's stupid. I just lost my head for a moment. I was, I was just sitting there scratch, and the guy came along, he was so fast, he didn't know what to do. And it just, it just cannot, I cannot get it out of my head. You know, <laughs> I start doing it, and I'm doing it. It's like, it's like, like a hack in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Reboot. Just, it's just a part of it. I have all these little voices in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and they just never let go. <laughs> but, well, you know, have you ever worked with, have you ever, uh, you know, uh, seen Scott McNeil? I don't know how many of you have seen Scott McNeil when he shows up. Man, oh man. That boy's got a lot of voices in his head. <laughs> and I've, been, I've been working with Scotty for. <coughs> 20, 23 years uh, in different shows. We have done tons and tons of shows. And I think I've heard his real voice. <laughs> <laughs> Ten times? <laughs> but it's hard to get him because, you know, because in this kind of a situation, you're always on, you know, you're always working and, and, uh, and playing it up and that. And at work, of course, when we're at work, we're doing our voices, so. Uh, but uh, every once in a while when you get into it, you know, just, we're just sitting there having lunch. And then I'll go, oh wait, that's what you sound like. <laughs> <laughs> that's who you are. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, no, no I, I love Scott. He's, he's a wonderful guy, wonderful uh, actor. Yes, sir? Can I ask, uh, this voice actor, you know, if it's an actor you see on TV or a movie all the time, you know, you recognize instantly when you're walking around. But if you go into a restaurant some, somewhere like that or a grocery store and you use your voice, does anybody ever pick up on that? Oh, yeah. Yeah? I've had that happen. Well, actually, several times I've had it. With, what's happened is uh, I sat in a restaurant. Where the hell was I? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere it, it was like Denny's or something, and, and this guy came up to me and goes, "Oh no, that happened at one time." Boom, that happened one time. <laughs> um, it was a Denny's. The guy, I know that voice. I've heard you before. You are. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I knew it was you. I know that voice. I can hear that voice. And then uh, one time I, I, I took my car in to get in service and I had to take the bus home. And I got on the bus and uh, this guy walked, a 
who was talking to this lady, that, you're Optimus! <laughs> <laughs> this, this, black, this big black guy he came up and he was on the bus and he was in the Navy. And he was just coming from the Navy. And he said, you're Optimus! <laughs> you're Optimus, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, uh, yes. He said, I know that voice. I don't know the faces, but I know the voice. And you are that guy. <laughs> I said, well, my God, it's so nice to be. Can you sign my book? <laughs> Take the bus home. <laughs> of course, that started because, because the rest of the people on the bus go, I thought you looked familiar. You're that guy on that show. And I go, yeah. <laughs> and now it's like, you know, it's like this. Yeah, and the questions come, and the questions come, and it's just, it's, yeah, it's fun. But, uh, very rarely uh, I get uh, get recognized for the voice, I get recognized in my face a lot for for different uh, TV shows and movies and that, but uh, the voice, once in a while someone will come up, I know that voice, I know you, I know you, it's okay. I got sort of upset, and, but uh, I, thought that I think the funniest one was, it was uh, Mobile and Obama shooting a, a little film there in the college and, and I went into they have this there's <coughs> sub places where they have the firemen the firemen run these uh, sub stores and they donate part of it to charity it's called, I don't know what it's called. It's, a, it's a fireman's uh, red hot red hot uh, sub uh, sub sandwiches and I walked in and I said well I can't Grab me a sub. So I walked in, and the girl walked up and said, Yes, sir, can I help And I said, Yeah, I'd like, like a sub, please. And I said, Okay. And then uh, she my arm, she walked away, and then you could see her, she was talking to her, to her workmates. That's not the same guy. Why is he doing it mobile? What the hell is he doing in mobile? <laughs> <laughs> so you are that guy in the movie. I knew it was you. I won't go say nothing, but I want to bet. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then the other girl, she's standing at the side and she goes, It's so funny. I mean, you know, at home, you know, you, 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 you go into cafes and you, you do whatever the hell it is you do. Nobody takes you blind. Man. Notice. But in America, it's different. In America, people watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, they do. No, they watch TV because it's, it, it, it seems to happen more here. I mean, I used to go to Las Vegas. The the, uh, the, the girls who carry out the drinks and the, and the change girls. They all seem to watch Lifetime television. I was like the king of Lifetime. I had like 50 movies on Lifetime. And they all came up and they said, ha, ha, you're in Stand Against Fear. You're in this, you're in that. God, so I see you all the time on Lifetime. Yeah, and every time I turn on Lifetime, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it happens, but it, it, it's just the way it goes. It's, it's kind of funny. So. You can tell you enjoy it. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. How was it working with Richard Dean Anderson? Oh, it's a struggle. <laughs> 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 Such a drunk. <laughs> the drug problem it was the worst way was the violence. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Richard Dean, I've been working with Richard Dean for over 20 years, so um, I worked with him the first time uh, in MacGyver way back when. Uh, and, uh, was a sort of a standing joke in uh, in uh, MacGyver is that every Christmas the, the show that came about three weeks before Christmas in December, the first week of December, they'd always give me a guest starring role in MacGyver. 
which I thought was kind of cool. Nice Christmas bonus. He says, no, I said, well, why do you bring me a beer? He said, ah, we like having you around before Christmas. It's kind of fun. So they give me a show every Christmas. And uh, that was very nice. And then when they brought Stargate, uh, they, they, they said, uh, well, we, we're, we're doing this new show called Stargate. And uh, just check it out. And I said, oh, do I, do I have a part in it? Well, we're looking for something for you. Year one. Year two, <laughs> year three, no, no auditions. And I'd see uh, Michael Greenberg and Richard. I said, well, what the hell's going on? I thought you guys were going to bring me in here. No, we're just looking for the right part. Season four comes out. We got this part for you. I said, it took you long enough. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great part. And I said, okay, uh, how's your Russian? <laughs> I said, come on. <laughs> no, 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 we, we, we want you to play this Russian. And I said, well, okay. Uh, can you speak Russian? And I said, no. Ah, you'll learn. <laughs> so we, we, they, they brought a, um, this fellow, Sasha, who's a Moscow film director who worked as an actor in Vancouver named Sasha. And uh, he came and, because uh, all my scenes were in Russia, the first episode. So I'm going, so I got to speak Russian? And he says, yeah. So everything is, and I'm going, I, I, I don't even know how to pronounce those words. They, 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 they consonants I never heard of. And this guy was, was very strict. It had to be exactly, uh, exactly right. And so we spent three weeks learning phonetically the Russian and getting the acting beats for the Russian uh, for these scenes in the first uh, episode of Stargate. And uh, the guy, uh, after after three weeks, he says, "You know, it's really weird, but you sound just like Stalin." <laughs> he said, "You sound like like the real Stalin, like Joseph Stalin. You sound just like him. You have the same Georgian accent. You have the same vocal quality. It's it's really eerie." <laughs> well, that's great. So it's working. Oh yeah, no, it's great. it's great. So I go to the I go to shoot the, the first episode and. Uh, my Russian is hot, I'm in there, yeah, come on, yeah, yes, a new blue, let's go. And uh, walk in and uh, Peter Delawise, who was directing the episode, turns around and said, ah, we're not gonna have enough time, we're gonna have, we have to cut, we just need the last two lines of that scene. And I said, you bastards! <laughs> I just worked for three weeks trying to get this scene right and you're telling me that it's cut? I'm doing it. He says, well, you can do it. We're not going to Come on, Peter, that's not fair. He says, I worked really hard on this. And he goes, okay. So we did the whole scene, all the scenes in Russia. We used the last three lines. <laughs> but, uh, but it started and I, I ended up going on for a few years on, on Stargate. So they were always good to me. And, uh, and Richard was just... He's very funny, you know, but he has a very uh, wry sense of humor and a really, really fun guy to work with. Uh, when you first get there, you you you, you wonder, you go, oh, okay, what are we doing? But you know, when you see it on screen, it's working, and uh, he just he just goes and goes and goes. He's retired now, but uh, at that time we used to have a really great time. And, and people who didn't know how his humor works. How we, you know, crack at you, would get kind of not put off, but sort of discombobulated. So uh, his co his co stars for the first season, pretty much. Huh? His co star co stars for the first season. Yeah. They didn't know about him except through MacGyver. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they worked out great. Uh, Amanda was uh, fantastic, and uh, uh, Don Davis, bless him, uh, he was. Uh, he worked as uh, Dana Elkar's stand-in on MacGyver <coughs> back when. So Dana and our uh, Don and Richard had a history for years, and so they got along like a house of fire. Everybody in that in that show, it was the greatest set to work on because everybody knew it. 
you know, we've all been working together for so many years. It was like there was no real, no real struggles, no real, you know, like ego battles or anything. It was just like, yeah, yeah, we're doing a show, and let's just let's just do it. And it was really fun. And uh, Chris Judge is an absolute boot. Just go play golf with him and work with him on occasion. Michael Shanks, the same. They're all really, really nice people. And Amanda, boom, have it on the stick. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. A girl! <laughs> Yay! They do exist. And I apologize for this question in advance, but when you are in an annoying situation, like um, say you're at the airport and your flight's canceled and you're dealing with bad customer service, do you ever get the urge to slip into the primal voice or the human voice to get your life? Well, I'm done. <laughs> so the question is, when I get into a situation at the airport, do I pull out the primal voice and say, you don't know who I am? <laughs> no, I don't do that. I'm actually pretty good. Um, sometimes it just gets a little crazy. Like yesterday, ah, there was a guy sitting next to me on the plane. He absolutely reeked. <laughs> he didn't bathe. He looked, it smelled like he'd been on a plane for a couple of days. And was, you know, it was, and it was hot, and, and I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm going, please, please turn the fan turn. I'll be good, I'll be good, I won't say anything, I won't say anything. I said, I paid an extra $41 for this. <laughs> I think, for some unknown reason, for some unknown reason, because my elbow was touching his elbow, he didn't like it. So he got up and went to another seat. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, I never. Uh, I, the only time I've ever gotten, you know, like that is I. Uh, I was on a plane flying to Las Vegas, and the plane was full. And there was a woman, no offense, but there was this woman who must have weighed about 400 pounds. Okay, oh. 80, somewhere around there. But the seats on, on those little planes are really small. And her stomach was right here against the seat ahead. And she was squished. She couldn't get in. She had to lift up the bar and then and she had to slide, and she couldn't walk down the aisle, she had to go down sideways down the aisle. Well, my seat is right here. And her butt <laughs> was on this half of my seat. I mean, no, I, I, I can't say anything bad about it, but this, this half of my seat. So I only had half a seat to sit on. But there was a, a bulkhead, right? To, like the Vulcan, so there was two seats and an empty space, and I guess they put luggage or something like that there. So I sat on the side of my seat like this, facing the, uh, the fuselage wall, and uh, this little fella comes up to me and he goes, yeah. excuse me sir, you cannot sit sideways on the seat. <laughs> and I said, well I'm really, and I, and I pulled him to the side and said, <laughs> you see that gal is inside? She takes up the whole seat. <laughs> I have nowhere to sit. I don't want to sit on her and squish her. <laughs> but you can't. DOT forbids you to sit sideways on the seat. Forbids you and forbids you. And I said, man, then just find me another seat. There is no other seat. The plane is full, sir. And I said, well, then I'm... Well, then I'm sitting sideways. <laughs> Mind you, 
The girl beside me was completely oblivious. <laughs> no, she doesn't. Laughter, right or not, she just and it, it was. I can't describe it. It was a hill of the lash. She, she, she sat in there just like job of the hat. It's not her fault. I mean, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but she, she can't help being large. It's just, an, it's just the most unfortunate situation where the, the seats are so small. You know, and I, I, I'm a big fat guy myself, so. But anyway, anything, anything you want to know about how you do this stuff? How you get into, how you, for a career? How you, Pursue it. Actually, I don't have a question on that. I just wanted to ask, what were your thoughts the first time you read the script where they killed your character off in SG-1? When they killed my character off, I went, at least I've got a glorious death. And it was the last season. And I was in the Corey Lev and the jet and the, uh, Racketeer! And the, this glorious firing at the, the Ori and getting annihilated. But they said, well, no, that's not true. You're not dead. And I said, well, I don't see myself coming back anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, you may have escaped with Brad and the life pods. Because there were several life pods escaped. And I said, would my character abandon this ship? They said, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> so I died. But that's okay, because the series died too. I mean, that's, that's the way it goes. But it was such a nice the, the thing on, on, uh, on YouTube. They have this great thing that they do that theme music for Hunt for Red October, they put all the, the clips of my character on there, and the rock and the ship blowing up. It was a glorious death. I don't mind that. It's a murder. It's on there forever. It's great. Yes? How much did Sue Blue use um, G1 to influence you? Direct Peace Force and the other Transformers shows you've worked on when she's been the voice act, uh, voice director, or did she just say we're going to start fresh? Uh, for the, for Beast, uh, Beast, Beast Wars, Wars start fresh. New characters, new uh, <coughs> new direction, and uh, I thought it was quite uh, quite cool the way she did it. Yes. Uh, how did you establish yourself within the uh, industry, within the voice acting or acting? Uh, how did I establish, my, how did I get started and uh, get yeah. rocking and rolling? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I, uh, I started my, my voice career doing uh, uh, corporate videos for the government. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of um, uh, very sexy videos, it was called uh, Leave Reporting in the Superannuation System. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was, uh, was called uh, uh, Pension Benefits. The other one was called uh, How to Assemble and Disassemble a, uh, a um, FNC-1 Semi-Automatic Rifle. Uh, <laughs> just oh, wonderful titles. And uh, so I did a lot of uh, voice for the government and, uh, and, and training films and videos for the government uh, in Ottawa. And then uh, I was doing, a, there was a show called Alien Star Lost, and I used to play, uh, and they called me in to play uh, the alien voices, I had no idea. But uh, I went in and, and gave them, you know, Hungarian, and uh, they, uh, they seemed to like that, for a Hungarian kind of thing, and they went with that, and I thought, well, well maybe there's something to this. And then the Hiawatha came along, and then when I came uh, to Vancouver, or back to Vancouver, uh, the first thing that uh, I read for was a thing called Tech Force, and uh, didn't go. I didn't get it, so I'm, okay. And then Barbie and the Rockers, one of the first animated Barbie shows called Barbie and the Rockers. And uh, I ended up playing a couple of voices on there. And uh, the, uh, the woman who was the, uh, the director of that, or producer of that from Deke Animation said, you know, we like you. We want you to come and read for this. So I ended up uh, reading for Captain Nintendo. And I did Captain Nintendo, and um, it seemed like every time I did a show, they would say, well, we have this other show. So I did Captain Nintendo, and uh, 
and Kissy Fur and uh, and uh, Dream Patrol and E Man and GI Joe and all these other shows just kept coming from Deke and, and uh, they uh, they just liked what I did I guess but uh, that's what I did and I put a voiceover tape together and this is what you know been talking to my friend Candace over here who's a very talented artist. Uh, is also uh, an, an, an aspiring voice artist and wants to put that voice tape together. Still hasn't done it yet, really. Not the finished product. And uh, and that's the thing. The, the, the whole thing about it is, is to practice. Practice your voices. Put your strongest voices on a tape, not more than three minutes long. Uh, and, uh, and and farm it out, you know, to the, uh, to the different agencies. And see if you can get an agent who will would take you on and uh, I was fortunate in, in that uh, my first voice agent uh, Gail Murphy um, was not really uh, interested in, in voice work because there didn't seem to be any money in it until I started getting these shows and then uh, some of our other uh, uh, agency members started getting shows and all of a sudden it became a huge industry which made our agency very wealthy and made a lot of us very wealthy. So um, she started pursuing that on a big way and, and farming our tapes out to, to internationally and, uh, and marketing our, our people internationally, internationally. And we started to get uh, shows from England and from France and from uh, Australia and from uh, the United States and Canada. It's not just the United States. We just go all over the place. I mean, uh, Jean Chalopin, who did uh, a lot of the, like Tintin and things like that, and, and uh, Asterix and Obelix, you know, we did all those shows, and they're all from France, but you, they show them on American TV, and they're all come from France. Uh, the, the, so that one, the, uh, the cat one, there's this one about a cat, a crazy cat, uh, it'll come to me, but it's also from France as well. <coughs> yes? How hard was it not to laugh in some of the totally ridiculous scripts that came through, like the one in Beast Wars where Rhinox defeats Megatron by farting? How hard was it not to laugh in your reading, reading scripts like that? You know, farting is a crystal. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I've had my uh, you know my moments in the studio where. Uh, at the end of the season, on one show, I was presented with a can of Florient, or what you call Febreze, <laughs> because it used to get crazy, you know. People would be laughing and killing themselves and rolling about on the floor and trying to get a straight face. And, 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 and sometimes it was very, very difficult. I don't review it all of the Coca-Cola story. The Coca-Cola story is in, uh, I was doing a show with uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. And I had to, um, or no, not Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, Captain Zed in the Dream Patrol. And I had to make a big, huge belch. So I drank a can of Coke. And I said, okay, I'm ready. And I went, whoa, like this. And all of a sudden, all this Coca-Cola just went, oh. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. It was like it was wrapped in an amniotic sack. <laughs> <laughs> so made this ball, and it hit my script. And I went, <laughs> and never left a mark on my script. <laughs> And Phil Hayes, who was playing one of the characters, looks over and he goes, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God! Ian Corlett is going, Holy crap, holy crap, holy crap! The assistant in the office is falling on the floor, and all you can hear is, Ah! Ah! And they're all howling. Right? And I went, Wow, that was amazing. We had to stop. 
like 15 minutes <laughs> to, for people to get composed. <laughs> they would just, they would, they, would, they would do one of these. <laughs> you could, nobody could look at me, so I had to, I had to sort of turn away because if, if they were saying their lines, and they, they're looking at their lines and they, look, they looked up. <laughs> they started feeling themselves laughing. The poor girl who was making all the uh, takes and recording of the script assistant, she could not talk for 10 minutes. She could not talk. She said, Line two! Ah, I can't do this! <laughs> but it's never happened again. It only happened that one time, and it's never happened again. It was, and I think it's on tape somewhere. Yes, again. What? Time. Oh, time. Holy moly, look at the time. How, many, how much time do we have? I think it was supposed to be over 12.30. Huh? I think it was supposed to be over at 12.30. So we're kind of cutting Oh, we went over a little longer. <laughs> but uh, that's OK. Uh, I've got one. Uh, yes. Well, one last question. Uh, earlier you had uh, discussed uh, trying to put a, uh, a Peter Cullen spin on the uh, Optimus. Uh, do you have maybe a, a can you give us an example of that? Uh, what what that might have sounded like had you done that? He said, Peter Cullen would say, we have come as protectors of the people of Earth because they are too weak and too small to defend themselves. And a great evil comes from this... No, how's it go? And a great evil comes from a faraway place and we will protect them. And he'd, he'd have this, you know, I, I wish I had the script in front of me. I can't do it with it. I'm just making it up as we go on. But, but he had that very solid place called Earth. You know, I like that. I like that. You know, like the opening of the, of the movie. I hate the movie. <laughs> Especially number <laughs> <in a> two. <laughs> no, no, number three makes up for it. <sighs> Let's say we will go home. Ah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you uh, play the piano and, and such that you uh, make music. Do you make your own music too? Sorry, what? Do you make your own music too? I make my own music, yes. Have you thought about do, uh, pursuing that as well? I have a producer. We are, we are putting the CD together. Um, we've uh, been writing songs like crazy. <coughs> and, uh, I, uh, my producer is in Europe right now. He's coming back in a couple of weeks, and then we're going to sit down and we're going to uh, plan a CD and an album and, and get it up and sell. People have, seem to like it. I don't well, know. Have, they like it, right? Have you it's thought, okay. Have you thought and, about it? Uh, people seem to really enjoy it, so uh, I've had so many people saying, well, you've got to, you've got to put the CD together, and the, the music people are saying, put the CD together, and I've got a lot of musician friends back who said, hey, I'll put my time in. So I said, okay. So we're going to hold it up this year. Has that trickled in with your voice acting? Like, you wanted to do both music and voice on a show? Oh, no, I, I've been doing music and voice for, for a long time. But on the same But project? I haven't uh, really pursued the, the commercial end of music. Uh for decades, because my film and voice stuff was, it, it just takes up all my time. And now I have a little bit more time, so I've been playing around with doing the music. And, uh, yeah. I'm liking it, you know? It feels I'm liking it. You meet a whole lot of different people. That's some really, really wonderful, wonderful singers and uh, wonderful musicians. I just uh, ran into, uh, a uh, week before last, uh, Sam Neill. You know Sam Neill from the, from the what's that, Jurassic Park? Well, his daughter, Michael, this uh, Japanese-Australian gal, yeah, is a tremendous singer and songwriter. And uh, she came out with us uh, a couple of times to some venues to, to play. And, uh, and my friend Don Alder, you, you met Don. And Don Alder came, uh, he's like the best acoustic guitar player in the world. He's amazing. You look, at, look him up on YouTube. And uh, he uh, played a couple of tunes with her. Just fantastic. Just a, a, amazing singer. And, uh, and I find that, you know, the more different things that I do, the more different people that I meet. And 
it's a whole uh, it's a whole other world, the music world, you know, from from acting and, and, and voicing. There's a lot of singers who do voices, but there's not a lot of musicians, right? And now meeting a lot of musicians and playing with a lot of musicians and uh, having a great time doing that. So I'm gonna yeah, I'll probably be done by this year. <laughs> anyway, I got I think I got time for one more question, and then it's time for rock and roll. Maybe uh, I think we've got something else going on. Yes. Uh, the gentleman before asked you about your, your, your um, career, like working with other voice actors and your experiences with them. Uh, I was wondering if you had any stories about Jaleel White, the voice of Sonic the Hedgehog. Jaleel, you know, I've got to tell you something. Never met him. Okay. I figured, Never met him. I figured Never him. saw him. Only thing I know about Jaleel is that show. Yes. <laughs> that TV show. Because he recorded, him and Tails uh -huh. recorded in Los Angeles. And everybody else recorded up in Vancouver, so we never really got to meet him or, or talk to him or anything. It was uh, it was quite bizarre because I'd like to have met him because he's a totally different guy from what I've heard from the guys. It's a totally different guy from the guy you see on the TV. You, you wouldn't recognize him on the street if you if, if you were talking to him. You wouldn't realize. Him. <coughs> Are you Jaleel White? No. No. You kind of look like. Him. No, 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 that's, uh, that's another guy. Unless you walk around with blue spiky hair, that people don't know what I mean. Huh? Maybe you start walking around with blue spiky hair, that people don't know what I mean. No, it didn't work. Anyway, everybody, thank you very much. Later on this afternoon. <coughs> All right, thank you so much for coming.